Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today's episode, we're talking about the topic of optimal health. I've invited Dr. Mary Perdee to help us answer the most fundamental question, which is not are you healthy, but are you in optimal health? Mary is gonna walk us through a two hour, two hour deep dive podcast. It's long, but don't be scared. It's truly, truly worth it. She's gonna walk us through a two hour deep dive podcast on exactly that topic. Are you in optimal health? By covering a lot of the major labs that are out there that many people are familiar with. You know those reference ranges when you get your blood work back from your doctor that says this is high and this is low and okay, you're somewhere in between? Well, those reference ranges are all based on the normal population. Well, normal is that most people are obese or overweight. Normal is that most people are not in optimal health. So we don't always get the best idea of whether or not we're in optimal health by just looking at those ranges. Mary is gonna help us understand what ranges are out there that show us what optimal health looks like in today's podcast so that you can ask better questions to your healthcare provider and dial in to your best health ever, which is so important right now, especially during coronavirus and so many fears about compromised immune systems or being at risk of uh, being uh, taken over by the virus. I think this is a fascinating episode. You're gonna love it. Um, I learned a a few more things and I thought like, wow, I know so much about this area. I learned a ton of new stuff. So I wanna thank Mary for that. And uh, here we go. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, and mindset, all with the goal of helping you understand how your brain and your body are not broken. I'm your host, Drew Perot, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, especially during these times, live more. This week's guest is Dr. Mary Perdee. Dr. Mary is a naturopathic doctor and certified functional medicine doctor who specializes in integrative gastroenterology and hormone balancing in Los Angeles, California. She's the founder of Modern Med, a telemedicine and virtual wellness company that provides medical and health services to clients across the world from the comfort of their own homes. Dr. Mary is also the chief medical officer and board member for R Academy Global, an organization whose mission is to provide opportunity to homeless and formerly incarcerated individuals with a holistic 360 approach. She's also a dear friend of mine. Dr. Mary, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you, Drew. Thanks for having me. It's been great to get to know you over these years. We met uh, we met at the Feel Good Summit. We did. We met at the Feel Good Summit. Yeah. And then you were there at the time. You were finishing up your uh, education in naturopathic medical school. Mm-hmm. And uh, you were helping out Bulletproof. And since that time, not only have we become friends, but you've also worked on some really fun and inspiring projects with Dr. Mark Hyman mm-hmm. as a medical writer mm-hmm. and uh, content producer. And one of those that I've always appreciated and loved and has done really well is for a company that I invested in called Commune. And they, uh, we created a course, you, me, Dr. Hyman, our team, Kea, my sister, we created a course for Commune that is the inspiration behind this podcast. Yeah. And that course uh, is this idea that a lot of people go to their doctor, their regular doctors, uh, Western trained, who are well-meaning, they go to their general physician and they go in for their annual checkup. And in that annual checkup, You know, they might have a physical examination, the doctor checks in with them a little bit, does some lab work, other things like that, calls them back to go over everything and says, okay, everything looks normal, Mm -hmm. you know, just keep it up, you know, maybe might tell them to exercise a little bit more, to do some light level stuff that's out there, maybe include meditation if they're stressed out, but in general is sending them off and saying, you look good, I'll see you next year. Mm -hmm. And on the other end, the people that are on the receiving end of that advice, they often feel like, okay, I know you're telling me that I look good and that my levels and blood work and everything like that and labs look normal, but I'm not sleeping well. Mm -hmm. I'm stressed out. Maybe my hair is thinning. I got this rash over here. Uh, Not that this is all one person or it could be all (laughs) one person, but people, just because they get the check of approval from their doctor, physician, again, who means well, they don't actually feel optimal. So this conversation today is all about 
how to truly feel optimal, how to step into our optimal levels of health. So I asked you to come in and do a lot of what we did for the course, and you can find the link for that below in the show notes, which is go through and help people really understand what does it mean to be truly healthy. So thank you for being here and jumping into this conversation. I wanna start off with this first. Do you ever get patients who come to you and say that they just had that type of experience? I can't tell you how often I get the patient that comes in and says, yeah, I just went to my doctor, you know, they, I feel like I have a thyroid problem. They said everything was normal though. Um, or, you know, they checked my hormones, everything's normal, but I haven't had a cycle in a year, you know, but they just send the person home. So this is really, really common. And, um, and I think this is where functional and naturopathic medicine shine is digging deeper and really getting to a holistic, but also just a more comprehensive approach that gives us a much bigger picture of what's going on with an individual. Perfect, so this is almost gonna be like we're running through like a little uh, patient uh, meeting. Yeah. And we're gonna go through and we're gonna talk about what does it really mean? And why don't we start really big picture on this topic of what does it really mean to be healthy? Mm -hmm. How do we know if we're actually healthy or not healthy? What is health in your opinion? What is health and what is true longevity? Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, and it's a hard question to answer. It's the most simple question, right? But we, when we actually answer it, it's one of the more difficult ones to answer. But I really think that health is all-encompassing in terms of mind, body, spirit, which functional medicine has that matrix, right, where we talk about all of the aspects of health. And it's not just about physical health. It's not just about your lab ranges, even though we're going to dive into that today. It's not it's just about, about what supplements you're taking, of course, because no. I'm sure you see so many people who they're doing everything right, but they're stressed out of their mind. Right. And so they can't actually get better. Right, yeah, so we need all of those foundations in place in terms of mental, emotional, spiritual, physical health to really have a the big picture health. When it comes to longevity, which is a passion of mine, anti-aging, um, when we talk about longevity, we have to talk about two things, health span versus lifespan. So modern Western medicine has been, you know, has done a really phenomenal job at increasing lifespan. People are living longer, right? Um, and it's it's in part due to the fact that we've found medications that keep, can keep us alive, you know, penicillin to get rid of infections that would normally cause death if we didn't have them or other things, you know, to treat diabetes or cardiovascular disease. So we have things that are keeping us alive longer. However, our health span is not optimal in my mind. So health span is your quality of life. You know, how are you actually feeling? And when we look at um, health span, ideally what we want it to do, if you looked at a curve, like a longevity curve or a health span curve, you want your quality of life to be really, really high, and then you want it to drop off suddenly. The last thing you want is that it'll start decreasing at a rapid decline at the age of 50 or 60 years old, where you have a really long period of time with decreased quality of life, but you're still alive. Which mostly comes from chronic disease. Chronic disease, exactly. So chronic disease is the leading cause of a decreased health span. And so when I talk to my patients about longevity, I really want to decrease the rates and the likelihood that people are going to get chronic diseases. I would ask my dad, because we have a pretty solid documented history of our family uh, uh, tree and my dad I think can go back as like far as like 13 generations it's mm -hmm. like pretty nuts and one time when I was younger I would ask my dad because uh, there was somebody in our family that uh, was who had got, got diagnosed with cancer and I was just curious and I was like oh you know how did our great-grandmother you know his grandmother my great-grandmother how did she pass away he's like she just passed away in her sleep mm. you know yeah you just passed away in her sleep she was super healthy she would run around, she would do different things like that, she was active, other things like that, and then one day at a ripe old age, she just passed away in her sleep. And that's what you're saying is what we're looking for, Yes, is that we go, 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 and not that we have a heart attack in our 50s or you know, mm -hmm. early 60s, or we have an autoimmune condition, which mm -hmm. then leads to this, and then we have low mobility, and so we fracture our hip, and then we develop dementia, like that's what we're trying to avoid by exactly. focusing on our health at whatever age we are right now. Exactly. And so one of the ways we do this in anti-aging medicine is we're looking at the leading causes of death 
right? It's super simple. If you want to increase longevity and health span, you figure out what is actually killing people and focus on those things by a large percent. So cardiovascular disease, number one cause of death in in America. Cancer, accidental injuries is actually really common. It's the top four. Um, Accidental injuries means that you could have broken a hip. Osteoporosis is a leading cause of accidental injuries as well as just decreased balance. So we're gonna talk about that when we talk about the muscular system in the body. Um, Respiratory diseases, the big picture there is don't smoke and that's gonna reduce a lot of the deaths from respiratory diseases. And then neurodegenerative diseases is like Alzheimer's. So these are the things that I'm bringing up because when we do blood work, this is what we're trying to prevent. You know, you're not doing blood work necessarily for exactly what's happening right now, but we want to increase your quality of life, sure, right now, but also increase your lifespan years down the road. So when I ever, you know, like a 30 or 25 year old person comes into my practice, I'm so excited because this is the best time is when you're young to really dive into your labs there's no time that's too late, of course. So any time is better than no, never starting it. Um, but these are really preventative things for the years to come, as well as to increase how you feel right now. Yeah, we've had different experts, even on the topic of like Alzheimer's, come on the podcast, Dr. David Perlmutter, uh, uh, Dale Bredesen, Dr. David, uh, mm-hmm. Dale Bredesen, and they both have been very clear that says, you know, the earliest signs of Alzheimer's actually can show up years and years ahead, sometimes Mm -hmm. as mid of your 30s and 40s, because of things like having crazy blood sugar levels or Mm -hmm. being pre-diabetic range or X, Y, or Z. So all these upstream markers are the things that we wanna catch early so we can step into optimal health. So now that we've laid that foundation, let's jump into it. And the goal of this is that just like you may not understand every aspect of the stock market or just because you're not a certified financial planner doesn't mean you don't need to know how to ask good questions to understand where your money is going or how to set up a budget. And so our goal here is not to replace a doctor. In fact, Mm -hmm. we want you to work with a doctor, somebody like yourself, Mary, or other functional naturopathic doctors that are out there, or even just a good solid Western doctor who's Mm -hmm. willing to be open-minded and ask questions and dig into like what's actually going on that is leaving you not feel great or in optimal health. So we want you to be able to be proficient. We want you to be literate in your lab work, in your blood work, in the examination so that you know what type of questions to ask so you can go into your appointment even with your regular doctor because you know there are some challenges with functional medicine and naturopathic medicine these days. It's not covered with insurance. One mm-hmm. day in the future it will be. And there's things like telemedicine that you're doing that are bring, bringing down the cost of that. You know, I'm an investor in a company called Parsley. They're also trying to do the same as really try to bring down the cost, but it is, expensive right Mm -hmm. now. That's the unfortunate situation because health insurance isn't covering it. One day it will. And in between that time, if you have a regular, I hate to say regular doctor, but let's say not a functional or naturopathic doctor, this podcast will help you ask better questions Mm -hmm. or even sometimes ask for things that maybe they weren't trained to ask for or look for so that you can bring them the right literature or information to see Are they seeing the full picture when it comes to their thyroid health or other aspects that are there? So Mary, what's the first thing, Dr. Mary, what's the first thing that we want to jump into uh, when it comes to um, this appointment of people understanding, are they truly healthy? Yes. And so in med school, if there's any med students out there um, or just general practitioners, the first thing you do when a patient walks in the room is you look at them. So simple. Ideally, you're not buried in your chart or your, um, you know, medical records, but you actually just look at the patient. What is the patient's appearance? So, you know, when I look at somebody and I say, are they apple or pear shaped? So this you can do in a mirror. You actually don't need a doctor to do this at all. But where are you carrying your excess weight if you are carrying it at all? So with women, if you're carrying it around your hips, we'll go into hormones later, but that can show that you may have some estrogen dominance if everything is around the butt hips range. Um, And then versus if you're carrying a lot of weight around the midsection, so you're more apple shaped, then that can be a really a big sign of cardiovascular disease risk. So that's where we have increased fat mass around our visceral organs, your actual internal organs that can be a risk factor for metabolic disease. And I think that's such an important topic because we had Dr. Ronesh uh, Sinha, who is from um, Palo Alto, the Bay Area, and does a lot of work with the South Asian community. And he was saying that, you know, 
on the topic of like metabolic syndrome and on the topic of making sure that we have uh, healthy blood sugar levels and we're not eating foods that are constantly spiking our blood sugar, we will first notice it in that midsection there. Mm -hmm. So if we start, even if you are thin, right, or skinny fat, which we've talked about in the podcast before, we want to pay attention to that midsection there because if we are developing um, that that sort of midsection, that hip to waist ratio is a leading indicator of what might be going on in our health. Yeah. Yeah. And so I do a lot of hormones with women too, but one of the things you'll see in postmenopause is the lack of the smaller waist and more of just this box shape, right? So it can also tell you about your hormonal health that maybe you don't have enough estrogen around making you have that hourglass shape. So there's an appropriate amount. It doesn't mean if you have hourglass, you have estrogen dominance, but are you carrying too much weight in your hips? And there's a lot that can be said to just the appearance of the body and how we can interpret it from a lab standpoint. The other fact that I want to or point I want to get across is that a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about are just signs and they need to be followed up with testing, which we'll get into later. So not necessarily treating based off of, you know, how something looks alone. Yeah. Another disclaimer with this podcast is that, of course, always work with the healthcare practitioner. This is just educational information, you know, to inspire you to ask better questions and be proficient in what's going on with your health. That's the main goal. So let's jump into the next uh, area that is um, vitals. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the first thing, one of the first things your doctor will do is get you on a scale or the medical assistant. Um, So weight. Weight is not one of my favorite vitals. It gives us virtually no information. We give what, way too much information. We like we pay attention to it way too way much. Way too much, yeah. And so weight, um, the, the issue with weight is that you can have, you know, Rob Gronkowski, is that his name is Rob? <laughs> I'm Gronk not from the Patriots. Okay. So you can have this big football player, right, who who weighs 250, 300 pounds, um, but is solid muscle. If you calculate his BMI, meaning basically his height to weight ratio, looking at where he falls in the BMI, he would be obese. You know, he would be beyond the standard of normal weight. He would be in the obese category. But if we look at his waist to hip ratio, I guarantee I think Gronk is probably fine in that area. Um, so I want to talk about what the, the best thing to go to is going to be waist to hip ratio versus weight alone. So this is the ratio between basically the smallest part of your waist, which is right below the lower ribs. And um, so you take that measurement and then you take the measurement, which is right below the belt which is your hip measurement. So it should be one of the widest parts of your hips. And that ratio is going to give you more about your metabolic health than your weight alone. So for women, ideally, you're below a 0.8. And for men, you're below a 0.9. With that being said, is that everybody's bodies are different. But these are, again, like you said earlier, guidelines that are there to pay attention to to see if something is going on that's different. Yeah, yeah, and the next best thing, so you know, if you don't have access to this, then waist to hip is great, but if you can get a DEXA scan, which is actually gonna look at your percent body fat, percent um, fat mass, that's gonna give you a lot more information about your body composition, so that would be my gold standard for people if they have access to it. Yeah, and if you can't find a DEXA DEXA scan, there's um, another machine that's out there called in body machine yep. that a lot of gyms these days and I've seen CrossFit locations have it sometimes and it's a little bit more widely available that's out there. Okay, great. Let's go to the next item. Yep. So heart rate. So heart rate is really simple. It's how fast is your heart beating? Um, a lot of the times if you're not in, you know, tachycardia, which means really high heart rate or too slow then your doctor isn't going to not tell you anything about your heart rate. However, we know that a heart rate greater than 80 beats per minute can be detrimental to your cardiovascular disease risk long term. So just so so everybody knows. Resting heart rate? Resting, well, resting heart rate and just, you know, your normal heart rate that you're not exercising. So if you just go into the doctor, technically a resting heart rate is when you wake up in the morning, which is hard to get people at. But a normal heart rate is anywhere from 60 to 100 beats. So you could go into your doctor, you could be a 95 and they're not going to say anything to you. But we do know that above an 80 even increases your risk for certain diseases. Got it. And again, a practitioner could work with you on it to say, all right, yeah, figure out why. Yeah. Are you anxious? Are you stressed? Um, Are you on Adderall or a prescription stimulant? You know, those are all causes of an increased heart rate. Um, On the other side, is your heart rate too low? 
if you're a advanced runner or an Olympic athlete, which I definitely have some of those in my practice and they're hanging around 45, normal for them. However, if you're not a runner and your heart rate is too low, then I'm thinking as a practitioner, do you have hypothyroidism, which can cause a decreased heart rate? Awesome. Let's jump into the next one, which I think you have here is blood pressure. Yeah, well, first I wanted just to note with heart rate, um, the next best thing is heart rate variability. And unless you have a functional medicine doctor, I don't think your doctor is ta- talking about heart rate variability. So this is different from heart rate in that it's the beat to beat changes in your heart. So your heart goes lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. That's the sound it makes. Your heart doesn't go. Dropping beats. <laughs> Um, And so there's a time interval between dub and the next lub. So it's amount of milliseconds, right? And we actually want that interval of time to change. We don't want your heart to beat at the same rate all the time. So if you have a heart rate of 72, it could mean that your heart rate was 69, 74, 68, 72 so it's changing it's actually adapting to your environment and that's exactly why heart rate variability is important because it's a reflection of your autonomic nervous system and its flexibility so is your body able to switch from parasympathetic which is rest and digest to sympathetic which is fight or flight easily increasing and decreasing your heart rate based on your surrounding environment. A high flexibility of that nervous system is indicated by a high heart rate variability. So you actually want a very high HRV. It's an indicator of longevity and heart health. So we originally found out about HRV due to the cardiology research that was being done. And for people who are at home, knowing that most traditional doctors may not look into this, if they wanted to explore in this direction, you know, are there devices or things that they can pick up to start looking at that heart rate variability? Yeah, and I talked about this a lot in the sleep course. So this is one of the things that I covered because it can be an indicator of how um, your sleep quality is. Um, but the th- the two that I recommend, I should say three, one of them is Inner Balance Device by HeartMath. HeartMath is one of my favorite companies. They're also leading the research in HRV. That's looking at heart coherence more so, but it's a training device to increase your HRV and your heart coherence. So it's a wearable. It's extremely um cheap too. It doesn't cost much money. Um, The other one is called Whoop and I use this with my athlete patients. Whoop is a wearable, goes around your wrist and it'll give you an HRV number on a daily basis so you can adapt your training to it. And then the other one is Aura. So Aura Ring is a great wearable. It tells you a lot about your sleep quality as well. Awesome. Perfect. Let's jump into the next item. Yeah, so blood pressure. Blood pressure, your doctor will definitely tell you about if it's too high. So we know that blood pressure increases your risk for atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease if it's too high. Um, However, on the other end of the spectrum, your blood pressure can be too low. And we see this in women a lot of the time, especially thin Um, tall women. So the body is a pump system. It's no different than pistons in a car. You need enough pressure to get the blood to your brain, which is upstream from your heart, right? So it actually has to go against gravity. And you also need enough pressure to get it to your extremities, like your hands, your toes, your feet. People with cold hands, cold feet, or, you know, decreased concentration abilities, things like that, and they have low blood pressure, one of the first things I'm going to do is try to increase their blood pressure. So you're going to ask, like, what is low blood pressure? Where do we make that cutoff? And there's not a great cutoff, but I really want the optimal values to be 110 over 60 being on the lower end of where we want to see blood pressure and then up to 120 being our cutoff on the high end so conventional medicine will say anything under 130 over 80 is normal but i really would like to see it within those ranges so you know your blood pressure is high enough to increase your energy levels your cognitive thinking and just how you feel overall and you know a lot of people hear from their doctor like i have high blood pressure i have low blood pressure i think high is more common yep right what are some things that lead to potentially high blood pressure. Yeah, 
Yeah, it can be atherosclerosis is going to be one of the most common ones, which means that you have plaque buildup on the arteries and it decreases the size of your arteries so that when your heart pumps, it's pumping against resistance. So that's going to be one of the big ones. Um, also vasoconstriction. So constriction of the arteries, whether it's due to being in a, fa- in a state of sympathetic dominance, like fight or flight all the time, your body responds by constricting those arteries. So again, there's too little space so when your heart pumps it's pumping against resistance it's like a fire hydrant trying to go through a garden hose now there's less space so it's just blowing through there yeah exactly what's that's also why meditation is great for high blood pressure but side note um okay next we're gonna go into just general physical exam that should be included in you know your first visit with a doctor so your doctor will look at your extremities which means they're gonna take a look at your nails they're gonna take a look at your fingers your toes and we can tell a lot by just doing this these simple things so the first thing i want to talk about which isn't technically an extremity is your like having a cold nose but having cold hands and cold feet that can be one of the first signs or one of the most common signs of hypothyroidism so So low thyroid function is going to decrease your metabolic rate and result in just cold extremities. The other thing can be decreased circulation. So if you have poor circulation, your hands and feet can be um, chilly all the time. So you should talk to your doctor about that. And I know in the book, Dirty Genes, I can't remember what gene it was, but there was some gene that was there. I'll look it up. Is it nitric oxide? Yes, nitric oxide and its relationship to, and that's probably related to circulation. It is. It's related to circulation. So if your body is not as capable about as putting out and producing nitric oxide, then you're going to go into that state of vasoconstriction that we talked about with cardiovascular disease. And if you have vasoconstriction, meaning that your arteries and veins are getting smaller, not enough blood is going to circulate to your fingertips. So it's going to first serve your internal organs before your extremities and obviously there's different tests that people can do out there and they can look into that with a practitioner but in the case of it being somebody is more genetically predisposed to that what are some things that could potentially be helpful for that yeah and i'm not familiar with that snip which is when we say snip it means like a mutation in the gene Um, but to promote nitric oxide production exercise is one of the best things so getting your body moving is going to help circulation no matter what the cause is actually fantastic Um, Okay, so we talked about extremities. The next thing is nails. So your doctor should look at your nails. And there's a lot of things that, again, that can trigger the idea that, hey, maybe this is causing the issue and then lead to testing. So one of the most common ones that I see are ridges. So if your nails have little bumps in them, vertical ridges, it's possibly a sign of zinc or iron deficiency. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, also, if you're if they look at your nails and they're white, like you have no color to your to your nail beds, that can be possibly an indicator of anemia or iron deficiency as well. Now, brittle nails they break all the time. You know you can't grow your nails out. Um, you want to look at thyroid function and again iron. So you'll see iron as a really common thread between a lot of these things. And you'll see sometimes people who promote collagen for hair, skin, and nails. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So collagen, my thought, my thoughts are that collagen is a great protein source for people. So I think it's just, it can be part of your diet on a daily basis. Your body is going to break down collagen to the, the amino acids that it comprises of, and then it's going to put those amino acids where it needs it. So just because you take in collagen doesn't mean it goes to your hair, skin, and nails. You might need it in the basement membrane of your kidneys that day. Like who knows where it's going to go. So you can't tell your body where, where it goes, but I do, I like collagen just because it can be really easily digested for people. What about mouth and tongue? Mouth and tongue. Okay. So when we look at the mouth and the tongue, we're looking at, first of all, your tongue can tell you a little bit about health. A lot of it is oriental or Chinese medicine, which I'm not familiar with, with, you know, reading the tongue. But that has been an influence both in naturopathic medicine and also a little bit in functional medicine. Yep. No, for sure. And so um, one of the things that I look at with the tongue is if you have this scalloping, so you have these little like grooves in your tongue, what that means Um, And when I say scalloping, it's like half moon, right? Like you have like little indents in your tongue. What that means is that those are actually the indents from your teeth pressing on your tongue. 
And that's because your tongue is too big, so it's expanded. So it's actually that it, your your tongue's a little bit swollen, and you might see it's like red as well. We call or that your glossitis. Your jaw is too narrow, potentially. Potentially, that's like Western a price um, thought yep. process for sure. Um, but when we see it acutely, meaning that it wasn't always there for that person, then we think, why is the tongue a little bit bigger? And there's certain deficiencies that can cause that glossitis, which is the technical term for it. And one of them is B vitamins, as well as iron can cause glossitis, that kind of swelling of the tongue. And other times I've heard, again, functional and naturopathic doctors say, I want to just see what your tongue looks like before like you scrape it, if somebody uses a tongue scraper, because if there's a lot of discharge that's there, it could be an indication of something that's going on inside the body. Yeah, and sometimes we'll see like a geographic tongue where there's like um, patches of things, but it's not uniform. Um, a fissure in the tongue in oriental medicine, which means just like a groove in the tongue, can tell that it's possibly re related to the GI system. So, you know, there's definitely people that are tongue readers, and I'm not one of them, but you can get a lot of information from the mouth alone. Okay, what's next? Um, I want to talk about like the little cracks that you can get in your mouth. So angular chelitis is the name for it, but you know on the sides of your mouth like where your smile mm -hmm. creases the are? corners of your mouth. Corners of your mouth, thank you. Um, if you get cracks there often, then you want to look at your B vitamin status as well as iron or zinc levels. So there's going to be deficiencies in those as well. I know growing up I used to have that and I was just eating a lot of processed foods. Mm -hmm. So lacking and just general vitamins. Just probably. general vitamins. And I think a big part of it too is like, there's a lot of oils that we thought that were healthy, right? Peanut oils mm -hmm. and soy oils and corn oils that people thought were healthy back in the day because they weren't butter. Mm -hmm. And that would actually give me, make me more likely to have dandruff, make me more, more likely to have dry skin, would have more cracking, just like all over my yeah. body, more ashy, that sort of stuff. And when I finally got out of that, you know, whole world when I changed my diet and moved towards whole food and had an oil change, as like doctors like to Great. say, uh, all that stuff went away. Yeah, and you just teed me up for the next one, skin health. So one of the most common things we see is dry skin, like you mentioned, flaky, dandruff, dry skin. That's one of a, the big signs of essential fatty acid deficiencies, which lines up with what you just said in childhood. I had, I mean, it was embarrassing, but I had terrible dandruff in high school. Yeah. And I used to just think like, okay, I got to get this dandruff shampoo or do that or this other thing. I grew up vegetarian, right? My parents were vegetarian. I was doing the best that I knew how. And obviously you can still be a healthy vegetarian, mm -hmm. but I can imagine my essential fatty acids were so deficient. And then once I corrected that, not even thinking that it was related to dandruff, that just went away. Yeah, that's great. Incredible. Good case study. I need to go back in time and tell my high school Your self, small self yeah. hey man, start eating some fish <laughs> yeah. and take some fish oil. <laughs> All right, um, what do we have next? On the, on the flip side, a lot of people can have really oily skin. So we might see um, too much testosterone. Women with PCOS, you know, things like that. We're looking at testosterone as a possible cause. Um, we talked about hair. So hair, hair is a common one. Um, if your hair is just falling out, you have dry, brittle hair, again, you're going to want to look at your thyroid function for that. Um, premature graying can be copper or B12 deficiencies. And then just thinning of your hair over time, um, you want to look at things like zinc, selenium, as well as protein, not getting enough protein on a daily basis. So when we look at smell, are you smelling right? This is actually a neurological exam that is part of a physical exam. Very few doctors are actually testing smell, but people that can't smell very well or they can't distinguish between scents, you wanna look at a lot of your minerals, iodine, iron, copper, um, also vitamin A, B. So you can see how, okay, how do you figure out which one is right? We're gonna talk about actual micronutrient testing coming up, so you don't have to be guessing at these things. And how do you, uh, how do, you do that in telemedicine? Yeah, we, we have no issues with testing and telemedicine because we can usually either send a phlebotomist to your house or we send you to a lab. Um, so, you know, and it just is there a test that you would do to help people? Like, how, do you just ask people, like, do you have challenges smelling? Like, do you have a good sense of smell? Yeah, I mean, you can you can ask people these questions for sure. And then I do see people in person when I need to do specific things. Um, but, you know, people are usually going to know if they're not great at smelling. Um Next exam is we want to look at the neurological system. So, you know, this is your central nervous system. One of the tests that doctors will do is those little hammers that they hit on your knees, right? And it should create a reflex and you should kick your foot out. 
and that's called a reflex. And if you're if you're slow at producing that reflex, it's one sign of hypothyroidism. So low thyroid function can be slowed reflexes. If you kick your foot out way too far, like it's a hyper reflexive person, then you actually want to look at certain neurological conditions that can be more serious. So MS can actually show up as um, a heightened reflex. Now there's things that some people just have high reflexes too. But And is that as common? You know, I mean, you used to see it in the movies all the time back in the day. People, doctors would have like the little, what's that? The hammer, the reflex the hammer. hammer. Yeah. You used to see it all the time. And I can remember being a kid and having that done. Mm-hmm. But do adults get that done anymore? Is it a common thing? I don't even know. It depends on, a- yeah, it depends on your doctor how thorough a physical exam. I do it on virtually all of my patients that come in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, for, for brain too, hopefully your doctor's watching you walk. So I'll always have people walk down the hallway. And sometimes I even have them do you know, the DUI test, which is one foot in front of the other, heel to toe. And we do that because we're looking at how the cerebellum is functioning. So that's the balance center of your brain. As we age, the cerebellum can really deteriorate and is one of the first places that we see neurodegeneration. So balance is incredibly important, especially in the older population. But you don't want to just start checking people's balance when it's already deteriorating. We want to figure out and catch it beforehand. So I do really intense balance exercises. For younger people, I have them stand on one foot, close an eye. Like I'm really pushing them to see where their limit is. And if they have any deficits in that, that's their homework. Okay, go home, practice standing on one foot with your eyes closed every time you exercise and see how long you can do it before you fall over. Safely, of course. (laughs) Because especially as we start going back to the earlier part of the conversation, when we look at the top reasons for uh, death. Yeah, Alzheimer's and, and neuro- neurodegeneration, exactly. And, and even separate from that, even if people don't have that, it's fracturing your hip, ending up in the hospital and deteriorating over there and ultimately passing away, which is very common, or just falling and dying in that moment, which, you know, that happened to yep. a grand uncle of mine. Yeah. You know, you lose your balance, you lose your motility. So it also could be a good indication that somebody needs to add some more movement into their world. Uh, or yes. it could probably give you some indication on. Shoes, you know, shoes also too, like completely like mess up people's feet and balance and other things like that. Like, have you ever tried to like, sometimes people get really cutesy and they put shoes on dogs and <laughs> dogs are so confused. They can't even walk correctly and they're, they sometimes fall, their balance is off and everything yeah. like that. So, I mean, there's so many things that if you don't have good balance, it's a good indication to improve that Uh, for a whole host of reasons. Yeah, and I think sometimes we focus on balance for athletes. Like, oh, I'm not an athlete. I don't have to walk a tightrope or something like that. But like you said, it's actually decreasing your risk for accidental injuries, which is in the top three causes, leading causes of death in our country. That's so nuts. Yeah. So important. Um, So we talked about neuro. The other thing that I do in my practice, which is not common, is we do volumetric brain scans for neurology purposes. So these brain scans can be done, I actually believe it's part of the, I do some of the Bredesen work, Um, but it's looking at 45 different areas of the brain and it's giving you the size of those areas and you're doing it so that you have a baseline. So I tell my young population, let's do one of these on you now so we can do it in, you know, one year, three years, five years, and we can see if you have any deficits that are, you know, building up over the years. People degenerate in different areas of your brain. So it's a use it or lose it situation. If you're a math person and your pathways for math are incredible and you're using it on a daily basis, that's not going to degenerate first in you. You're going to have degenerations in balance or, you know, other things that you're not using on a daily basis. We want to get a baseline for people to see where are your strong points. If you have any weak points right now, how can we improve those? So it's actionable as well. Um, But also, so we have something to look back at in, you know, 10, 20 years. If you say, hey, my, my memory hasn't been good. Well, let's go look and see what does that area of your brain actually look like? And has it gotten smaller? And when you're testing for that, what is that? Is that some sort of exercise that you're having them do? Is it a puzzle? Like, how are we testing for that? No, I'm actually sending them to a lab and getting a brain scan. So it's actually, yeah, it's actually a scan that we do. And for people that are curious about that, like, what does something like that cost? Yeah, and I have the price um, somewhere. It's not incredibly expensive. I know it's it's not ten dollars for sure. It's in the hundreds of dollars, but it's less than a thousand. Got it. Yeah. So, um, go ahead. So I think that we have one more component here before we get into some of the um, other more uh, recognizable labs and blood work and other things like that. 
And that's the muscular system. Yeah, your muscular system. So in conventional medicine, how they test the muscles is that we basically apply pressure to somebody's, say, quad, and we say, okay, push up against my hand. And you push up, and if you can move the doctor's hand, then you have five out of five muscle strength. That's like a pretty low bar. Like that's like saying, okay, you can just get up out of your chair. That's what we're saying is the norm or, you know, that's health at that standpoint. And I definitely have higher expectations for my patients in terms of their muscular strength. We've talked about this a couple of times now, but one of the leading causes of death is accidental falls. Your muscular system affects your brain health so much. So we're actually getting into neurodegeneration as well as reducing your risk for falls when we talk about strength. It's also one of the leading you know, factors with your metabolism. How much muscle mass do you have on yourself? Um, so I think that our new standards, instead of, okay, push against my hand, it should be, you know, how many push-ups can you do? How many pull-ups can you do? And how fast is your mile? So most of us, when we went to elementary and high school, at least I did, we had a fitness challenge that you had to complete in order to, you know, pass the state standards. And I don't know if they still do that in schools, but I think into adulthood, somebody else should be keeping track of us, right? It's like you graduate high school and your health issues are likely going to get worse, not better. So why do we stop, you know, putting up these standards for people to meet from a physical standpoint? So do you have your patients run a mile? (laughs) I don't. I think I'm going to start, though. (laughs) No, I'm definitely asking people about how many push-ups can you do. If you can't do any, then let's start. You know, if you can't do one, you can do it on your knees and do it and then build to a full push-up. So I have my yeah, mom if you can't do it on your now. knees, because some people are like, I can't even do it on my knees. Yeah. It's like, okay, you do a wall push-up. Do a wall push-up. Everybody There's something that. that everybody can do. Um, but really, you know, you want to set a goal for yourself and your doctor should be able to figure out what a healthy goal w- will be. But everybody should be able to do a pull-up. If you think about it from an ancestral point, we need to be able to pull ourselves up onto surfaces if it required us to do so, even if it's not in our job. Fantastic. So let's pivot over here and let's talk about Let's set up the next section by talking about reference ranges. You know, when people get back blood report or their hospital sends it over, their doctor sends it over, and they'll see something like a vitamin D. They'll see some of their thyroid labs, and they'll look at it, and there's, you know, a high, a low, and then let's say if they're like most people who go in for the doctor's office and they say, okay, your physical, everything is good, I'm going to send you home, you're okay. They'll find that they're somewhere in the middle somewhere. But those are all based on reference ranges, but there's something important for people to understand about reference ranges. Can you jump into that? Yeah, so reference ranges are basically based on the average population. So 95% of the normal population is going to fall under those reference ranges. That's how they're developed by lab companies. I got a lot of issues with this because 95% of the normal population, if we look at that in the United States, One in two people has a chronic disease. 70% of the population is overweight or obese. Um, We don't want to be focusing on the normal population. We want to figure out how to be in the optimal population, optimal ranges for health promotion. Where are you actually healthy and not where do you just not have a disease process? So reference ranges are going to tell you just that, that you do or do not have a disease process in line. They're not going to say, okay, you not only don't have a disease, but you're actually in a very healthy level for your age right now. And there are laboratory companies that are out there that have adjusted their reference ranges based on these to be more optimal. And those are often a lot of labs that functional naturopathic doctors are going to be using. So now that we know that, that just because you're in the reference range doesn't mean that it's optimal. Mm -hmm. It could mean that actually there's something subclinical. It hasn't Mm -hmm. been diagnosed yet. Mm -hmm. It's subclinical, but could be an issue. 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the line when it's actually so bad that it has a name. Right. And the best time to catch something and actually start treating it or preventing it is when it's very small. It's really easy to fix like a minor deficiency or, you know, slightly low levels of a hormone. When you get to the point where we can diagnose you, things become a little bit harder to reverse. So we're going to rapid fire go through these because there's a lot of them that are here. We're going to talk about nutrition, cardiovascular health, metabolic hormones, immune and inflammation, detox, and a few others that are there. Stay with us. You're going to really appreciate it. If you need a break, take a break, come back on the podcast and keep on listening. Let's jump into nutrition. Nutrition. What do we want to talk about when it comes to nutrition? 
because nutrition is one of those things that unless if it's like core basic things like iron, well, actually, let's do it this way. Yeah. What traditionally comes if people are going to a regular doctor's office, not somebody that's integrative or yep. functional or naturopathic or even sort of like optimized, what is typically the nutrition that they're going to get on that uh, uh, testing that they're going to do with their doctor? Yeah, so um, most conventional doctors will run a CBC, and we do get some nutrition information from a CBC. That's a complete blood count. Um, most doctors will run a vitamin D now. B12, I've seen some conve- conventional doctors run, as well as folate on occasion. And that's going to be it. So those are the only ones that I've seen conventional doctors run, unless something comes up where they're looking for something specifically, like B12 deficiency. Yeah, and so what do you want to say about those and what are the important ones to look to on top of that? Yeah, so you know, a lot of people can't see a functional medicine doctor, but they'll have those ranges at home. So if you have a CBC at home, which is a complete blood count, you'll see something called an MCV, which is mean corpuscular volume. It's a fancy term to say how big are your red blood cells. So we actually can get a lot of information from an MCV. It tells us, you know, how big are your red blood cells, and if they're too big, it's a sign of B12 or folate deficiency. If they're too small, that's a sign of iron deficiency. So, you know, say the normal lab ranges are anywhere from 70 to 100 ish for MCV, you really want yours right in the middle around like a 90. That's where I want people for an MCV. Again, if you're on one side or the other, the next thing is to go to your doctor and actually test for that. You don't want to just treat it necessarily. Um, For B12, the cutoffs for B12, um, I believe it's like 200 on the lower end and can go all the way up to 900 and something. Anything under a 600 is really suboptimal B12 levels. And you got to figure out why you're not absorbing your nutrients because B12 should be, you should be able to get it if you're eating a healthy diet. And B12 is not just like a very basic vitamin. I mean, it plays a crucial role in our nervous system. Yeah, it's a crucial role in your nervous system, um, but also energy production. Your immune system requires B12. Your white blood cells do. So B12 is used throughout the entire body. Great. What about some of these other nutrients that you mentioned? Let's talk about vitamin D. Yeah, so vitamin D is a superstar immune function um, vitamin, but about 70% of the U.S. population is going to be deficient or have suboptimal levels of vitamin D. Now, vitamin D, yes, it's immune, but it also is going to regulate bone density and really impact your overall health. The levels for vitamin D that are normal are anywhere from 30 to 100. We know that you prevent rickets at about 20. So if your vitamin D is 20 or higher, you shouldn't get rickets, which is a bone disorder that we typically associate with third world world countries. But the amount of people I've seen with vitamin D is at 12 in the United States is pretty astounding. However, research is suggesting that in order to reduce the risk for breast cancer, there was a study done that says if you have vitamin Ds greater than 38, which is even above the reference range, it's associated with a 21 decre- 21% decrease in breast cancer risk. Which is huge. It's huge. Yes, 21% is really significant. And again, that's that's information that's available in the research, but our lab reference ranges haven't changed. So why don't we all want to decrease the risk for breast cancer? We should be. So that's where we're saying in functional medicine, you know, 40 to 70 is kind of the sweet spot for vitamin D levels. You don't want to just be at a 30. Fantastic. What about some of these other nutrients and what about some of the nutrients that are more that require more advanced testing? What kind of test do you do you use or does a typical functional naturopathic doctor use to find out just more? Because there's only so much that's available on a traditional blood lab. Yeah. And the other one that before I stop, um, ferritin is one that a lot of conventional doctors will order. Ferritin is the storage form of iron and it's a great way to measure iron levels in the body. Um, But ferritin is super cheap and it should be able to be run by your your conventional doctor and it tells you how much iron do you actually have in storage. Iron is essential to produce energy in the body. It's needed to produce ATP, which is the basic energy source of all of our cells. 
in premenopausal women who are having a monthly cycle, they're losing blood on a continuous basis. They're at a really high risk of having iron deficiency anemia, which can cause a whole host of issues. So in, you know, in normal lab ranges, ferritin can go anywhere from a 15 to 150. There's research studies, though, that suggest having a ferritin less than a 30 can um, affect your mitochondria which are the energy producing organelles in your cells and actually decrease your mitochondria's effectiveness or how they're running. So my lab range for ferritin is 50 to 100 for women. You know, you really want to be at least a 50, ideally 100 or more for a woman. And then for men, they have less issues with iron. If there is an iron issue, you have to see your doctor because there could be something more serious going on. But ideally, men have um, ferritin levels between 100 and 300. And you had two others that you wanted to mention before we jumped into more advanced stuff. Uh, magnesium and zinc. Yeah, so these are because you can run these through your conventional doctor. So red blood cell magnesium levels, some conventional doctors will run, but it's an easy, accessible test that you don't need a functional medicine doctor to run. Um, they're in LabCorp and Quest. So magnesium is a miracle mineral. It's used in over 300 reactions in the body. It's I really... heard now it's actually known for 400 through <gasps> Sean Stevenson. Ooh, we just bumped it the model, up. model health show. He said it's uh, over 400. 400 different functions in the body. Yeah, I, I believe it. And it also helps us produce ATP, which we, we just talked about. Um, so, you know, you want your magnesium levels on the high end of normal. So it can be anywhere from 1.5 to 2.5. I like people at the 2 to 2.5 range for magnesium, but that is one your conventional doctor can run for you. Um, the other one that I wanted to mention that can be run through Quest or LabCorp is zinc. And zinc is super important for immune function, which is really important right now. It slows viral replication, supports your white blood cells, and is an easy um, blood test in any conventional lab. Fantastic. Let's talk about omega-3 and 6 fatty acids. Yes. So omega-3 fatty acids um, are not an easier test to run. Most actually Quest and LabCorp, they have them. The issue is that they're not always covered by insurance. So there's companies that are third party called Omega Quant is one of them. And then some of the eclectic lab companies are running omega-3 indexes as well. And most Americans have a um, omega-3 index of less than 4%. So that's very, very low. There, there was also a study that showed that having an omega-3 index of 8 to 12% is correlated with a 90% lower risk of sudden cardiac death, which is huge. It's massive. So it's 90% lower risk if you have a higher omega-3 index in those ranges. Um, just to put it in perspective, statins are going to lower your risk by 30%. They're Crazy. one of the most commonly prescribed medications for heart health. So and, we, and one thing that if you could just explain, when you say index, yeah. right, we're talking about a ratio. So why is that a ratio important? And what are the things on that ratio? Yeah, so we're talking about the ratio of omega-3 fatty acids to omega-6 fatty acids. Now, we used to think omega-6 were bad. Omega-6 aren't bad. We just want to have more omega-3 around. So we want to have a better ratio. Higher omega-3s, lower omega-6s, because in the standard American diet, omega-6 fatty acids are far more common than omega-3 fatty acids. And that's again going to be the vegetable oils. It's going to be any kind of like corn oil, canola oil that's often in a lot of processed foods, seed oils that are out there. Yep. There's obviously healthy versions of those seed oils, flax oils, things like that. They're going to be typically... Uh, higher in omega sixes, yep. and then omega threes. People are a little bit more familiar with those. Those are going to come from yeah. Biggest sources are going to be things like wild caught salmon. So your fish, sardines are a great source of omega threes. Um, you also get some in you know algae or walnuts, plant sources. But the highest amounts are going to be found in your really fatty cold water fish. Um, so you know trying to get your levels between an eight and a twelve, so you can follow the the stats for that research study would be my goal. And there is an at-home test that is from that company Omega, Omega Quant, Quant and I yep. think it's like 99 bucks or something like yep, that. Yeah, it's not bad at all and it's definitely worse, worth the, the Yeah, money. one of the tests that I think most practitioners would say is pretty easy for people to do at home. It's a little blood prick test mm -hmm. that you can mail back in and they have a, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward and it's pretty reliable. There are some tests that, you know, it's, it's t tougher when we'll get into it in a little bit, but like when people are doing food sensitivity test, a lot of the at-home tests are, are tough because they're not always accurate and you mm -hmm. kind of need a doctor to help you navigate that. But in the context of omega-6 and the omega-quant test, 
that seems to be pretty easy to do at home and pretty easy to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. What's and some, then, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to leave us off in terms of we're talking about micronutrients next. Yeah, in let's terms go to micronutrients. Of, yeah, so this is the next step. So if you can work with a functional medicine doctor, we have something called micronutrient tests, and they're actually looking mostly at your white blood cells and the nutrients that are within the cell. And that's really important because sometimes, especially if your doctor isn't familiar with the research, they might be running like a serum folate. So they're actually looking at the serum versus the red blood cell or the cellular amount of the nutrient. So you have actually want to see what's actually getting into your cells and what's helping you from a cellular level. So the most common ones are Nutra Eval by a company um, called Genova. And then SpectraCell is another great one that you can look at your micronutrients. So you can look at things like B6. You can look at vitamin A, copper, zinc, magnesium. Um, so it's giving you a ton of your micronutrients in a, in a really easy to read form, but much more than you could get at Quest or, you know, LabCorp alone. Which is so important, especially when we talk about the optimal ranges of things, all these different nutrients. You know, we talked about the big ones, vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, but things like copper and other nutrients that are out there, they play a crucial role in our health. And okay, somebody might argue that says, okay, we're all deficient in something. Yes, but when you're deficient in a lot of different categories that are there, which is very common because of our lifestyle these days, even if we're eating organic food, that's when major functions in our body can't happen at an optimal level. Yeah, so what actually these micronutrients do in our bodies, they're coenzymes. So they're actually facilitating enzyme reactions so that they can happen at a faster rate. You know, so a lot of these are just helping our body with these processes that would naturally occur, but they are needed in order for it to excel at a fast rate. So things happen quickly. You're able to produce your hormones, your stress hormones, your, you know, your immune cells, like all the things that we need on a daily basis for maintenance. And I think one of the common misconceptions is that, okay, well, I eat real foods, you know, I'm healthy, uh, you know, you're doing all the things, but about 98% of Americans are deficient in omega-3 fats, 70% vitamin D. 45% of Americans are deficient in magnesium. 10 to 25% are deficient in vitamin C, which is found in a ton of foods. So, you know, micronutrient deficiencies are much more common than we think. So true. What's the next category that we want to jump into? I say we go into cardiovascular. Okay. What do we need to help people understand about cardiovascular health and you know, the typical, I would say when it comes to blood work, like this is a category that a lot more people are more familiar with, but we're going to go into some of the details on it and the expanded um, labs that people can be asking their practitioner on, which really didn't get a lot of attention before are now starting to get a little bit more attention. So talk to us about cardiovascular health. What's typical and what can you ask for that's bonus to help people understand the true uh, cardio health? Uh, state that they're in right now. Yeah, and this is a big one when we talk about longevity and health span because it's a leading cause of death. Cardiovascular disease is also a silent killer, so you may not have symptoms of it, which is why we need to rely on the biochemical data that we can gather through lab work. Um, one of the biggest myths out there, which is still really common, and even conventional doctors believe it, is that cholesterol itself is the enemy, and that's just not true. So 75% of heart attacks are actually occurring in people with normal normal cholesterol levels. So you can tell right there that it's not cholesterol that's the issue. That means that there is something else that's the issue though, because otherwise cardiovascular disease wouldn't be one of the leading causes of death, right? Yeah, and just so everybody gets that, like people who show up at a hospital because they just literally had a heart attack or are having a heart attack, their cholesterol levels are in normal range, most of them. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, fifty percent. I actually have a study that looked at one hundred and thirty-six individuals with chest pain or a diagnosed heart attack. Fifty percent of those individuals actually had low LDLC levels, which is your concentration of cholesterol. So. Um, so the idea of lower is better for cholesterol, and you see this all the time, people being put on statins, just wanting to get that LDL cholesterol as low as possible. But LDL cholesterol, or I'm sorry, cholesterol in general is essential for our health. So your central nervous system makes up about 2% of your body weight, and yet about 25% of your free cholesterol resides in the central nervous system. So that's your brain and all of your nerves. 
kind of important. Um, so it's a huge component of our central nervous system and our brain health, but it also is going to encompass your cells and create your cell membranes and the myelin sheath, which makes it so that we can transmit messages through the body really quickly. That, that myelin sheath covers your nerves so you can actually send messages throughout the body. Um, there was one interesting study that looked at women with the lowest levels of cholesterol. They had a six time, so they had six times the rates of attempted suicide compared to women with the highest levels of cholesterol in that study. Interesting. Yeah. So what we're really learning now, and you know, uh, people like yourself and Dr. Mark Hyman, and other individuals have been talking about this is that there's different types of cholesterol that are mm -hmm. out there. Yeah, there's different types of cholesterol, um, but we, we want to get away from talking about cholesterol and focusing more on lipoproteins too. So it's just a different, it's, it's terminology, but the terminology, terminology becomes really important because it's not the cholesterol that's the issue, it's the lipoproteins. So LDL stands for low density lipoprotein. What your doctor measures on your lab report is LDL-C, and that's actually looking at the concentration of cholesterol in the LDL particles. So it's looking at cholesterol and not the lipoprotein. How um, atherosclerosis actually develops is that there's an issue with the endothelium of the actual artery, and these lipoprotein particles slide under the subendothelial space and there's inflammation present and then that creates this plaque and this buildup. So, you know, cholesterol is more so the bystander that's innocent and the issue is the lipoproteins. This is because, so this is all important because we want to look at lipoprotein particle number instead of concentration of cholesterol to really assess the risk for cardiovascular disease. And this is pretty well established now in the literature. It's just not being applied to clinical practice, which is super frustrating. So if you go to your doctor, they're going to give you a lipid panel and they're going to look at total cholesterol. They're going to look at HDLC, which is the concentration of um, cholesterol in your HDL lipoproteins and LDLC, again, the concentration of cholesterol in that LDL particle. Um, I do look at these, and so I have optimal ranges for them. You know, ideally, you want your total cholesterol well below 200. You want your HDL above a 50, ideally, and you want your LDL less than 100. Um, tri triglycerides are another, um, they're a storage form of fatty acids, and they can tell us a lot about your carbohydrate metabolism and your insulin sensitivity. So that is a really useful marker on your blood work that you likely have. If you have a triglyceride level above 100, it's indicating you likely have some sort of insulin resistance or you're eating too many carbohydrates. Ideally, you're below 70 for triglyceride levels. Um, again, lower is not better. You want to have a good range, but you don't want to be in the high range for tri triglycerides. Now, if you have a functional medicine doctor or somebody who's trained in cardiology that's actually read the research, the thing that you want to get ordered is something called an LDL particle number, LDLP. And again, this is looking at the carrier and not necessarily all the little things that it's carrying inside the cholesterol. So LDLP is looking at the number of particles in your blood. And ideally, you want your LDLP less than 700. So that's my kind of cutoff for people with um, to reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease. And, and that's a big one. And you can order that lab in Quest and LabCorp. So I do that a lot for my patients. And I haven't had issues even getting it covered by insurance. So if you have a doctor that's, you know, well-versed in cardiology, they should be able to order it for you. Yeah. And one of the big things that they're looking at is we're trying to avoid like the small, dense particles that are more likely to be an indicator of having heart disease or something else in the future. And leaning more towards the bigger cholesterol size particles mm -hmm. that are going to come from healthier sources of fats in our diet. Is that a good explanation? Yeah, yeah. And you can actually, there's a lab called um, your small density LDL, your SDLDL, that'll look to see how many of those small dense particles you actually have in circulation. I don't want to butcher this, but I believe Quest has a, a comprehensive test. It's like the um, cardio IQ, and it's going to give you a breakdown of all of these things. Um, the other thing that that test looks at is a marker called LP little a. So it's LP and then the A is 
is um, lowercase and in parentheses. We call that little a. And that is a, um, it's a marker on the LDL particle, but it's associated with a lot of um, risk factors for cardiovascular disease specifically. So we know that about two thirds of people with aortic stenosis have elevated LP little a levels. About 20% of the population actually has a high LPA level. And you really need to know this to reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease because it's one of the contributing factors is high LP little a um, particle numbers. What's interesting about some of these things, and I'll try to remember it, um, there's one more marker that's similar to this, is that elevated LP little a is actually an evolutionary mechanism for survival that helped our, our ancestors. And this is because it's associated with clotting. So it helps you clot your blood, which would save somebody's life if childbirth lasted, you know, several days or involved a lot of bleeding or, you know, you were fighting or there was war and you were bleeding out, clotting is protective in that instance. In modern day society, we don't have those issues. So the elevated clotting, you know, capacity of people with high LP little a's is actually detrimental to our health at this point. So, you know, that's really common to see that something that's harmful for our health may have been of service to us in a different um, time point or society. And I know you have this in a different category, but often uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, can yeah. be one of the things that physicians look at to also be one of the things that could be related to cardiovascular health. So what's CRP and why is it worth potentially looking at? Yeah, CRP and homocysteine are two where you got to figure out a place to put them in terms of categories, but they're both inflammatory markers in the body. So one of the you know ingredients for cardiovascular disease is issues with your subendothelial lining, so like actually artery issues, um, but the other one is inflammation. So cholesterol is not an issue unless you have inflammation present that can create um, this plaque in the first place, right? So HSCRP is an inflammatory marker, and ideally you want, you want it below a 1. So you want it very, very low to reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, elevations in CRP, you know, I have some examples of labs here, but, you know, you can see elevated CRP levels in people that are just overweight or obese as well. It's one of the causes for elevated CRP. Your doctor will figure out your cause for you, but it could also mean like you have an infection. Yeah, or there's a, a lot of things. It'll elevate based on any inflammation in your body. So what CRP doesn't tell us is it doesn't tell us where the inflammation is coming from. It just says, hey, there's inflammation there. Now go look for it. Another smoke detector. Exactly. Let's jump into metabolic. Yeah. So when we talk about metabolic health, um, one thing your doctor will run is a fasting blood sugar. It's part of a CMP, which is a complete metabolic panel. And your fasting blood sugar is not a great marker, honestly. Like I take it with a grain of salt. There's a lot of things that can elevate a fasting blood sugar if it's severely elevated, you know, you can be diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes, um, but it alone is just a pinpoint in time. So your blood sugar is going to fluctuate based on your stress, your hormone levels, what time of day it is, um, whether you've eaten or you're fasted. Ideally, you do want your fasting blood sugar between a 70 and 80 or kind of my functional lab ranges for fasting blood sugar. The next best marker for metabolic health is going to be something called HbA1c. So this is looking at your average blood sugar over the last three months. So it's not a pinpoint in time, but instead let's take all your blood sugar measurements, average them out and see where you are. So this is a much better marker because we can see, you know, did you have um, really high blood sugar levels throughout the majority of the last three months? You'll have an elevated HbA1c. Um, Normal ranges are anywhere from a 4.8 to a 5.6. Ideally, you want to be below a 5.5 with an HbA1c to reduce your risk for diabetes. Now, if your doctor is willing to or you're working with a functional medicine doctor, one of the best measurements for metabolic health is insulin. Fasting insulin levels give us so much more information about where you stand. And I actually have a lab here that shows that I, have, I had a patient who had normal fasting blood sugar levels normal HbA1c was 5.5, the fasting insulin was 23. So to give all the listeners an idea, normal fasting or normal insulin levels are going to be anywhere from a 2.6 to a 24.9. So she fell in line with the normal levels. If your fasting insulin is above a 10 or a 15, 
you're going to have a difficult time losing weight, but it's also a sign of pre, pre, pre-diabetes. So what I mean by this is that the first marker that's going to elevate in um, the disease process of diabetes is going to be fasting insulin, far before your HbA1c or your fasting blood sugar. So if your doctor is checking this and you can get that fasting insulin down with diet, exercise, lifestyle, supplementation, then you may never even develop pre-diabetes. And that's the best case scenario. That's what we were talking about before. Let's get people before we can even label them with anything at all so we never have to label them. That's um, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to throw in, so my, my optimal range for fasting insulin is about a five, and you don't want it too low either. You do want it to be around that five range. And in some cases, you know, we've done some podcasts on this before, but in some cases, a practitioner like yourself might also recommend that somebody get uh, a continuous glucose monitor as one of the things to support their metabolic health in addition to other you know categories to really help them understand and make the connection between what they eat and the spikes in their blood sugar throughout the day. Yeah, and I actually have two of my patients currently hooked up to Dexcom devices, which are continuous glucose monitors, and I've done it on myself and with other people. Um, but that is my favorite thing to do with people when what's, we can. What's an example of something that you, in your personal, since you did it with yourself, What's something that you would eat that you would consider as healthy, but that would, you know, kind of throw your blood sugar for a loop on this uh, monitor? Yeah, the two most important things I learned from that device were, number one, coffee spiked my blood sugar. So when I would have a coffee in the morning, um, it would raise my blood sugar above the level that I would want it to be in the morning. So caffeine can do that. It can actually mobilize um, glucose or blood sugars in your body. That's individualized. So I've seen people who don't have that response to coffee. So it's dependent and on the person. Do you think that has anything to do with you being a fast metabolizer or slow metabolizer? Just in theory, I do because I know I'm very sensitive to caffeine too. If I drink too much coffee, I get anxious. I go all over the place, um, which isn't fun for people around me yeah, or I myself. I forgot the gene or whatever it is, but there's like some gene that some people have that makes them yeah, more it's, sensitive. And it's one of the less. CYP. I don't know if it's 3A4, but it's one of, it, it is a gene and I forget the the name of it, but I'm definitely a slower metabolizer of So caffeine. coffee was one of them? Yep. The other one was I had a meal because I was like very scientific about it. I had a meal and it was less than a half of a cup of oatmeal and it was steel cut oatmeal and it had like six berries on top and that was the meal and it spiked my blood sugar more than anything else I ate during those 10 days, including I had ice cream. And so the oatmeal spiked my blood sugar more than the ice cream that I had. And then, you know, the thing to add to that is that it's okay to have your blood sugar spike as long as it then comes down and is in like a normal range, you know, like we want our blood sugar is supposed to go up, but what you're adding in is to see that effect. Did you physically feel different too when you had oatmeal? No, I didn't. And that was what was interesting, but I'd like to keep people kind of in a moderate range too. So I want people to not go too, too high because you know, that that will release a bunch of insulin. So there can be downstream effects. Um, but you know, for, and for you, look, if you looked at my curve, it was not that bad, but it was definitely more significant than say like my ice cream treat. So my um, my conclusion was that I should eat more ice cream. <laughs> well, you know, we <laughs> did this kidding. podcast again to bring him up, Dr. Rona Sina, and he has a lot of his, you know, he works a lot of like Silicon Valley CEOs and other stuff. He says, you know, we shouldn't be too, I know everybody has their own take and everything yeah. like that. I'm not trying to tell the doctor what to do. No, here. please. He was saying that we shouldn't be too obsessed with it because it's okay to have a spike, we have to also see how we feel, how we feel mentally, as long as then after that spike happens on a continuous glucose monitor, that it comes back down and we're not seeing like a curvature where basically we are having elevated levels for a while after eating that that meal. Yeah, yeah, and I would agree with that for sure. And that's one of the take homes that I've um, gained from you know being a practitioner that uses these CGMs is that one of the biggest issues I see with people is this prolonged elevated baseline in their glucose so that they're right. hanging up around a level that's too high for a long period of time. Um, so that can be a good a good thing to look at, but you'll never know unless you actually do one of them. Yeah, and uh, you still do need a prescription to get one of those. So you can ask your doctor for it or you can work with a doctor like Mary who can get it for you. Uh, all right, let's jump into the next category, hormones. 
Yes, hormones is one of my favorite things. Um, hormones in general, they're your messenger molecules in your body. So they're actually part of your endocrine system and they're delivering information all across your entire body, whether it's for good libido, reproduction, um, to regulate your metabolism. But these are really our messenger molecules that regulate every single function in our body. So I want to kick it off with men's hormones just because men are a little bit more simple, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> could say a few jokes with that one. Um, but let's talk about testosterone. So this is our, our main male hormone, the one that we talk about with men's health. It's not a male hormone. It's actually in women too, though, and it's just as vital in women as it is in men. Um, but we think about testosterone. What do you think of the first thing that comes to your brain when you say testosterone? Oh, this meathead or this jock or this person has too much testosterone or like this person's angry or this or whatever it might be. Right. Like roid rage or we think about the other thing is um, sex, libido. That's right. testosterone, right? But testosterone is needed for our cognitive health too. So motivation, drive, optimal energy levels, cardiovascular health. These are all things that are determined by your testosterone And levels. like you said, in men and women. Yes, and bringing it back to reference ranges, testosterone has a really interesting um, kind of story behind it. LabCorp actually recently changed reference ranges for testosterone levels for men. So they previously, you know, previous levels for testosterone used to be 300, I want to say, was the, the lowest range, and then it would go up to 1,200. They reduced all of those levels, so now that the lower cutoff is like 250-ish for testosterone, and then even the higher end is about 900 or lower. The reason they did this is because testosterone levels have be, been declining in men over the generations. Every year, the average population has lower testosterone levels. I don't think that this is the right answer. I think we are keep lowering the bar because our population is getting sicker and sicker versus saying, these are the standards. We got to figure out why everybody's testosterone is getting lower. Mm. So important. So important. Um, but for testosterone, I like men to be above 600. And testosterone will decrease as you age. That's normal. But ideally, you want to be above 600 for um, just general health parameters like we talked about. One of the biggest reasons I see low testosterone is going to be insulin resistance or, you know, diabetes or being overweight. Your fat cells can actually convert testosterone to estrogen in men, which will make you have more feminine features. That's where the term man boobs comes from, unfortunately. But about 35 or actually 39% of men over the age of 45 have low testosterone. So it's very prevalent. Um, ideally, your doctor will also order a free testosterone level. And just an aside, doctors won't order testosterone unless you have erectile dysfunction or severe libido issues. Um, so you really have to work with somebody who's more open-minded to get these labs run. Yeah, and sometimes if you just even ask nice and say, I've been reading this and these are the things that I have and you don't try to be too pushy about mm -hmm. it, then they'll... You know, you, a lot of doctors will say, okay, yeah, well, let's look into that. We don't typically ask, you know, for it for every patient, but sure, you want it, let's get it done. Yeah, and one of the reasons doctors might want, not want to run that test is that it might not be covered by your insurance. So you could even say, I'm okay with paying for it out of pocket if I need to. That'll take yeah, a lot of pressure little, off the doctor. And that's a little trickier because a lot of doctors don't even know what that price is. They can't tell you because it depends on what insurance you yep. have and you other stuff. You get stuck with a pretty big bill. And there's been times where I've gone or friends of mine have gone to the doctor's office and they have a very open-minded doctor and they order all this lab work and they come back and they have some crazy bill for like, you know, $2,000. It's a definite possibility and so that's not the doctor's fault. I'll put a plug in for the doctor right, for that one. Right, it's not a doctor's <laughs> fault. It's just the whole insurance system and the way that it's set up and what's covered and what's not. So that's tricky and... Um, we would need to write a whole encyclopedia about that to answer that. So yes. we're going to jump from that topic, but just more to be aware. And what about for women for testosterone? Yeah, so for women with testosterone, it's just as important. We need um, testosterone to actually support our musculature, so making sure that we're not muscle wasting as we age. Obviously, libido as well as motivation, energy, all the same reasons for women. Um, ideally, a woman, you want your testosterone above a 20 for women. I usually say between 20 and 40 at this point. If you're on testosterone replacement, sometimes you can get a little higher if you're really targeting libido or something specific with your doctor. It's not, com it's not 
uncommon though for a woman to have a testosterone below detectable limit. So I see that all the time and that's too low. First thing that I suggest is weight training for women. Mm, so key. What's the next one that we have for men? Yeah, for men, you want to make sure you're doing a free testosterone as well as a total because free testosterone is actually exerting the effects on the cells. Your testosterone is bound up by something called SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin. It's like a carrier protein in the body. So if all of your testosterone is bound up to either albumin, another carrier protein, or sex hormone binding globulin, then you're not going to get the beneficial effects of the testosterone despite having possibly optimal levels. So you want to see what your free testosterone is. Ideally, it's above a 15 or a 25 um, and you want to make sure your shbg is at a good level as well so that can be another one that your doctor orders what about dhea a lot of people have heard about it but they don't exactly know what it is or what it does yeah, so DHEA is a precursor hormone. It also has effects on its own, but if you look at the cascade of hormones in your adrenal glands, DHEA is the precursor to testosterone and estrogen. So if you have low testosterone or estrogen, supplementing with DHEA can sometimes support it. It's also one of our anti-aging hormones. So it supports good musculature, good skin tone, um, dry skin, low sex drive, like thinning of the muscles can all be signs of DHEA deficiency so it's a good one for you know the aging population or just making sure that you have vibrant good levels of hormones um, and for men and women I like a DHEA above a 200 high high levels of DHEA you can sometimes see in post-traumatic stress disorder which I've actually seen clinically before so you do want it in a good range between you know about 200 to 300 ish what next yeah, let's talk about estrogen. Um, estrogen is essential for both men and women. So we usually think about it for women, but same thing. Men need estrogen as well. Um, so estrogen helps us with libido, helps men with erections as well. And it also helps men produce sperm, which is fascinating. Wow. Um, for women, it's going to give you that hourglass shape that we talked about before. So, you know, a thin waist, but having some excess tissues, you know, having some fat mass around your hips, which is very normal and healthy for women. Um, estrogen also sensitizes your cells to serotonin, so it can support your mood, which is really important. Um, and then obviously estrogen is needed in reproduction as well. So with, with men, ideally, you know, you want your estrogen levels on the lower end between 20 and 40. Um, so it's going to be a little bit lower. For women, I like estrogen levels, especially premenopausal women, in a little bit of the higher range. So we're looking at levels of about 80 to, you know, the 200. 80 or 100 is definitely my lower end of the cutoff there. And that's going to be for menstruating females. So let's move to the next one for men, and then we'll go into women. Yeah. FSH. Yeah, Talk and this, about it. yeah, this is a quick one. So FSH and LH, these are hormones that are coming from the brain and they're telling the testicles to produce certain hormones. So LH will go down tell the testicles to produce um, testosterone. So that's actually the driver for testosterone. So we want both of these to be in a good level for reproduction as well as sperm production and normal hormone production. They're essential to be tested because they can tell you about your brain health too. Some men who have low testosterone but low FSH and LH, it's a brain issue. It's not an issue from the testicles. You want to figure out where it's coming from. So it's more of a diagnostic tool for, for doctors. So let's pivot to women. What do we want to know about women that we want to build on top of everything that you've already shared as you've kind of been going through hormones for men and women. Yeah, I've been double dipping, so I'm sorry, but I'll try to no, simplify it. No, it's perfect, it. actually. That's the best way to understand it <laughs> yeah. and uh, cover it. So I think it was great. Okay, good. So women, my favorite test for women's hormones is something called a dried urine hormone test a Dutch test, which is by Precision Analytical, a company that I work with um, very frequently. So that's that's like, if you can afford a Dutch test, that's what I'm gonna use if you're a woman. I do also test the blood for different reasons, but the, the urine gives us a lot more information about your hormones because it not only gives us your hormone levels, but it also shows us how you're breaking down your estrogen. So first I wanna start with progesterone estrogen and then I'll talk about these estrogen metabolites and why they are important in your general health. 
Let's talk about progesterone first. And um, with women in reproductive years, you need to make sure you know when you're testing. You cannot just test hormones on any day of your cycle. It'll give you virtually no information. So you want to make sure you're testing. Most of the time, I'll test women day 19 to 21 of their cycles. This is where you must test progesterone because this is when progesterone is the highest in a woman's cycle. This is your luteal phase, day 19 to 21. Day one is the first day of your period or the first day you see blood. So when progesterone is the highest is in this luteal phase and progesterone is the calming female hormone. So it actually talks to GABA, which is your calming neurotransmitter, and it helps really calm the central nervous system. This is also why you can have kind of anxiety, irritable sensations right before your period is because progesterone may be too low for you. Um, so ideally you want progesterone around a 15 to a 34, 35 and levels of progesterone in that range indicate that you likely ovulated and that you can maintain a pregnancy. So really important. Estrogen is your other main female hormone and estrogen is essential. Sometimes we demonize estrogen in functional medicine for estrogen dominance, estrogen is too high. Low levels of estrogen can cause hot flashes, vaginal dryness, depressed mood because of what we talked about with the serotonin, fatigue, poor memory, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease. So we really want enough estrogen around to make us feel good. It's kind of like our, our vitality hormone with women. This is also why a lot of women, if you ask them, they're gonna feel better in that follicular, the first part of their cycle, ovulatory phase than they will in their luteal phase because estrogen levels are higher during those times. Um, So, you know, mood things are really important with estrogen. So with estrogen, yes, you want it. If you have too much estrogen, which I have a lab right here that shows that, you know, we have too much estrogen and or not enough progesterone, that's a phase that's called estrogen dominance. So you Again, it's either one of two things. It's either too much estrogen or you just don't have enough progesterone in relationship to the amount of estrogen that's present. And that can have symptoms, which this person did, of painful periods, heavy bleeding, um, PMS, breast acne, tenderness, breast tenderness, fibrocystic breasts, um, fibroids. All of these things can be signs of estrogen dominance. And the Dutch test is one of my favorite ways to figure out why this is going on and how to fix it because it shows you how you're metabolizing and detoxifying your estrogens. So a part of the Dutch test, which you cannot get through a blood test, is it shows you phase one and phase two estrogen metabolism in the body. Phase one, the first thing that your body does is it adds a hydroxyl group to your estrogens, which is just an OH group in chemistry. Um, It does that, and then it sends it to phase two, where the COMT gene, your COMT is a gene that methylates, it methylates the estrogen, and then it's excreted. So with phase one, you start with estrone E1, and you can go down three pathways. You can make a 2-hydroxy, a 4-hydroxy, or a 16-hydroxy E1. There's research that shows that the 2-hydroxy E1 may be protective against breast cancer as well as prostate cancer. So I run this test for men and women if I can um, for that reason. The 4 and the 16-hydroxy E1 may be potentially more estrogenic and may increase your risk for you know certain conditions that are estrogen dominant, like we say breast cancer is estrogen related or possibly prostate cancer. I say possibly because you know we don't have enough research studies, but there are a few out there that show that correlation. Um, and then when we have phase two, we're looking at methylation. Are you able to actually methylate your compounds? Do you have a SNP in your COMT gene? Do you need extra B vitamin support? So these are really actionable tests because there's things that you can do to support phase one and phase two with just nutrition alone, which is great. An important thing about the Dutch test, uh, this dried urine test that you're talking about is that you're really not going to find too many conventional doctors that know or are trained in it. This is really a specialty lab and it's going to be somebody integrative, naturopathic or functional medicine or somebody like you who has all three of them together. Yeah. Yeah. And it gives you, it even gives you a a cortisol curve, which we'll talk about later, but that's part of the Dutch test too. So it's a really comprehensive test. I definitely think it's worth the money. Even if you don't have hormonal issues, it's also preventative in my mind long-term, just making sure your body's detoxifying those estrogens safely. What's next for women that we want to jump into and men too, I guess, but 
Yeah, so for women, um, we haven't covered something called FSH and LH, which is the same ones that we talked about for men. However, in women, we can tell a little bit more about what's going on with their body. PCOS is a really common hormonal condition, and you can test women for FSH and LH on the third day of their cycle, not day 19 to 21, but if you test it on the third day of their cycle, you can actually look at the ratio of LH to FSH. And what we see in women with PCOS COS is that they have increases in LH at this time, and so that ratio is usually higher. In a woman, you want it about a 2 to 1 for a healthy woman. If we see it at a 3 to 1, that can be an indicator of possible polycystic ovarian syndrome, which would then lead you down more testing. Talk about thyroid. You mentioned it previously, but what is common when it comes to thyroid? Because again, I think this is another one just like cholesterol you know a lot of people are just no like my thyroid you know it became very popular and uh i think oprah had something to do with that because i think there was this uh period of time i think in the 90s where oprah was like talking about her thyroid and it was on tv and she was telling everybody about Gotta it love Oprah, and uh she's the best by the way um, the world. so let's talk about thyroid what is typically included and how is that sometimes not always the full picture when it comes to thyroid health Yeah, most doctors will run a TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone. That's all that they will typically run. So TSH is the hormone that comes from your brain, tells your thyroid to produce thyroid hormone. And then those actual thyroid hormones, they're either bound again, just like testosterone, they're bound up by a protein or they're free. And it's the free hormones that can actually produce the effects on your cells and support your metabolism as well as support your digestive health. You know, you need normal thyroid to have normal bowel movements there's thyroid receptors on every single cell of your body so it affects your brain it affects your kidneys your liver i mean re- reproductive system you know women that have amenorrhea one of the things you have to ch- which is a lack of a period you got to check the thyroid for basically everything could be involved high cholesterol i've seen a girl who you know this is super common People that have high cholesterol and if they have thyroid issues you can totally fix their cholesterol if you fix their thyroid properly and i've actually got some labs about that over here Um, So your doctor will, will run a TSH and that is an important test. And ideally, you want your TSH between a 1 and a 2. Normal lab ranges for TSH are anywhere from 0.45 to 4.5. And if you tell me that a 4.5 and a 0.45 is the same it's ridiculous. It's a huge lab range and you can get a lot of different clinical representations of how you're feeling based on where you are in that spectrum. So we really want to make it more narrow. And I even have it even more narrow for people that come back positive for Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. So I have a special lab range for those people that I want to make it, you know, even more precise. Um, But in my general thyroid panel that I do on every single person, it includes a TSH, but it also includes a free T3, which is the most active of thyroid hormone you have. It includes a free T4, which is the majority of the thyroid hormone that your body produces. And it also includes includes your antibodies, which are thyroid peroxidase antibody, anti-TPO, as well as thyroglobulin antibodies, anti-TG antibodies. Those are the two that you would look for for Hashimoto's hypothyroidism or thyroiditis, which is about 90% of people who have low thyroid function have Hashimoto's. And you say, does it matter? Yes, it does, because this means it's an autoimmune process that's going on, that your body's actually attacking itself. There's some inflammation present. So you're going to treat it differently than you would just a normal low thyroid case. And it's often undiagnosed men can have Hashimoto's too but it's mostly women mostly women but I have actually two to three five men in my practice that have Hashimoto, so it's not that uncommon. It's definitely And it's the number one autoimmune disease out there, yep. I believe. It's Hashimoto's. extremely common. And I ask everybody that comes in and if they're on a medication, you know, do you have Hashimoto's? I don't know if I've gotten a person that even knows what it is when they come into my practice. So it's really not well known, um, but it does treat or it should change the clinical treatment of that. Right, because Hashimoto's, because it's autoimmune, again, 70% of our immune system in the gut, there seems to be a connection between autoimmune conditions like Hashimoto's and our gut health. And there could be a food sensitivity that's there. There could be a food allergy that's there. Sometimes you have a high percentage of Hashimoto's patients that are straight up celiac that have never been tested before. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's so many options, but it really, it deserves more digging. It also deserves a much more specific treatment plan um, to support the immune system as well as the thyroid. 
And thyroid is probably the one that I would say is like has, in addition to like the cardio health stuff around cholesterol, there's so much literature on thyroid and why all these additional markers that you had mentioned, the antibodies test, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the free T3, uh, T4, yep. why those are also essential. But I would say it's probably one of the ones that's the most highest that I see just conventional doctors not really trained in it and really don't know about what they have heard of these other tests, but they're not sure what the relationship is and then what to do about them. Yes, yeah, and I have um, I have actually a very high performing athlete and they um, came to me for thyroid issues, but you know, their TSH was a 1.2. So they even fall into functional lab ranges. I'm looking at their labs right now. So their lab was functionally perfect in the optimal range for TSH, if that was all that was run. However, when you look at their free T4, it was below range, it was 0.7. And their free T3 is a two, which is also, I like a free T3 at a three or above. Um, so they were not in optimal ranges for the three free thyroid hormones. So, you know, their medication wasn't working for them. And we ended up switching their medication, doing a bunch of other things. You also have to follow up that testing appropriately. So, right. you know, taking Once they're that on medication, testing yeah. it appropriately yep. to make sure that it's functioning correctly. Exactly. Yeah. But she feels a lot better now. So. So after thyroid, what's the next test that we want to get into? Yeah, and I'll do a quick. There's reverse T3, which I run on some people, um, especially initially. That's just because your T4 can actually get shunted down to reverse T3. Reverse T3 is like the brake pedal for your body. It's to slow things down. If somebody's under a lot of stress, if they have selenium deficiency, deficiency, zinc deficiency. These are all things that can increase reverse T3 and decrease your active thyroid hormone. So running a reverse T3 can tell us, you know, are you shunting your hormones down a pathway and why are you doing that? So that was my quick aside there. But cortisol tests. So cortisol tests, um, cortisol is your hormone that often gets demonized um, because it's our stress hormone. So we think we need low levels of cortisol. We don't. We need high levels in the morning and we need low levels at night. So it's much more based on your circadian rhythm as to where you want your cortisol levels. Cortisol is not bad. There's actually nothing that's bad in our body. It all has a function of some sort. Um, what is bad is if you have high nighttime cortisol, low morning cortisol, so you're fatigued when you wake up in the morning and you're wired before you go to bed at night. Um, and I have a great case with, with cortisol levels if I can find it. But basically, this person came in, uh, about a 30-year-old female, and her nighttime cortisol was twice the amount of her normal morning cortisol, and her morning cortisol was the lowest end of the normal range, and that's exactly how she felt, too. She was exhausted when she woke up, and she was wired and couldn't go to sleep. What we ended up doing is supporting her with adrenal adaptogens, so things like schizandra, um, rhodiola, ashwagandha that support the adrenal glands, which is where cortisol is produced, we also fixed her thyroid though, and her second curve is perfect. It's nice and high in the morning, nice and low at night. So you can actually see that these things work and they're really well related. So usually you're not just fixing the adrenals, sometimes you have to fix the adrenals as well as the thyroid at the same time to get good um, outputs. But with cortisol, it's a salivary test. So you do wanna do a salivary test if you're really looking at accurate measurements for cortisol levels. There's a bunch of companies that do them. There's home testing kits that you can do, ZRT, Genova, um, all of these have have them. They're usually called adrenal stress indexes or ASIs, but they're looking at your adrenals over um, a course of time. Your, your doctor can run a morning cortisol in the blood. It's not that accurate, though. Hmm. What to next? Um, we can go into immune. Yeah, let's go into immune function. Immune and inflammation. So we already talked a little bit about CRP. We did, yeah. So CRP, again, just an inflammatory marker in the body. Ideally, you want it well below a 1, ideally below a 0.7. And it's just general. We don't know where it's coming from, but it's a cue to us that there's inflammation present in the body that your doctor has to go and figure out where it's coming from. Homocysteine, marker of inflammation, also a marker of methylation in the body, which we talked about a little bit with estrogen metabolism. Methylation 
sounds complicated, but you're literally just adding a carbon with three hydrogens onto a neurotransmitter or a hormone or something to either turn it on or turn it off. So methylation is extremely prevalent in our bodies, and it really is a regulator mechanism that our body uses to either shut things off or turn them on. Um, people with an MTHFR mutation, so that's a gene that you have. There's two of them. Actually, there's several of them. The two most commonly run are 1298C and C677. But you can do that blood test and you can see if you have a mutation in that gene. If you do have a mutation in the gene, it can increase your homocysteine levels. So ideally, you want your homocysteine below a 7. So 7 is kind of my marker. You don't want it too low either. So I actually want people like basically right out of seven. If it's too low, it can indicate that you might be over methylating too high. You know, you're under methylating and you may need the support of a B vitamin or other methylation support. Fantastic. WBC. Well, yeah, this is the most common test and everybody has that has seen a doctor has had a white blood cell count run. So a WBC stands for white blood cell. It's a part of your CBC, which is your complete blood count. It's the one test that every single doctor is basically going to run no matter what is going on. Um, this one super important right now, especially because it's looking at your immune health. So white blood cells are the cells that fight infections, viral infections. Yeah, they're your little soldiers that you send out to actually clear any infections and make sure that things are well regulated. Um, you want your white blood cells above a 5.5 ideally. Normal is anywhere from, I actually believe it's a three. I think I had four here. It's anywhere from a 3.5-ish and then they go up to, you know, I think it's 11 for normal white blood cells. My cutoff is really a 5.5. If you have lower than that for white blood cells, there's something going on where your immune system is a little sluggish. I will say that I've seen some people that have low white blood cells, and I think it might be more genetic, I still want to support them immune wise and, you know, see if they definitely, if they get colds more frequently or they don't get colds at all, meaning that their immune system isn't reacting at all. Um, that can be kind of a hint as to whether they're affected by it or not. Let's jump into another category. It's our ninth category here, and it's detox. Yes. Now, detox is such a buzzword, but our body is detoxing all the time, and how well it detoxes is really also related to our immune health, because if we're not letting go and getting rid of things that we don't need in our body and they're recirculating, they're impacting the function and the health of our entire system. Yes, yeah, and your body can naturally detox. So you have a liver that's very efficient at detoxing. You have a, your kidneys, which filter things out, and you urinate. So one of the best things you can do for detox is drink a bunch of water and um, sweating also. But in terms of blood work, you're going to have things run called um, transferases, which are your liver enzymes you can look at in the blood. That would be in a complete metabolic panel, a CMP. They'll show you something called an AST and an ALT, and then some doctors will also run a GGT, and GGT is a little bit more associated with possible toxin exposure than the ALT and the AST, so I like to run all three if I can. Ideally, you want your liver enzymes in the teens for ALT and AST. So normal, I believe, goes up to 30 or 40 in some labs. I like people in the teens for, for both of those to have good detoxification. Um, these are more case dependent, but sometimes we'll run a mold test on people to see if that's inhibiting detoxification. About 30% of the homes in America have mold in them. And then same with heavy metal testing. So if people come back with Hashimoto's or we suspect that they've had high heavy metal levels, um, they have you know brain fog or other symptoms, those can be two other tests to kind of look at your detoxification pathways and if you have any toxin buildup. And often, uh, you know, off, I hear from I'm sure you have this too, you know, at the Ultra Wellness Center, our medical clinic in Massachusetts, where Dr. Hyman and other doctors are, you know, sometimes the patient will come in and say, you know, I felt really good and I even eat healthy and I eat clean and other stuff. And then I like moved to a new city and then all of a sudden all these health issues started, mm -hmm. right? And that's often can be sometimes depending on the, you know, and the doctor does the full patient history. It's like, okay, great. Let's look at mold. Let's look at some sort of toxin exposure. Let's look at some things like that to see if environmental triggers are part of the reason why somebody's going through what they're going through. Even on an extreme case, we've seen sometimes people moving closer to in a different neighborhood and some of our doctors will ask them, I know this is really random, but do you live next to a transformer mm. where you're getting a lot of electromagnetic radiation, mm -hmm. which we know that at certain level can cause DNA 
damage, especially when we're sleeping, so our body's not able to repair as much. So these are environmental factors which can impact how well our body functions and especially impact our toxin exposure. Yeah, 100%. And I've seen it in my practice where, you know, they've had brain fog, fatigue, their labs look normal, they don't have Epstein-Barr. And I'm like, when did this start? Oh, I was in, you know, San Francisco or, you know, whatever. When did you move there? Oh, and the dates line up when they moved and when all the symptoms started. So, you know, when when there is like a discrete um, time period where symptoms started and you're in a new location, that's one of the, the big signs that it, maybe it was your environment. Another one that's come up recently is that because everybody's driving less around this time with quarantine and other things like that, social isolation, stay at home. I have a friend who lives by the freeway. Like, not super close, but nearby. In Los Angeles, there's tons of freeways that are out there. And in seeing them the other day and talking to them on the phone, on FaceTime, they were saying that they aren't coughing as much. And it's like, oh yeah, you know, it's interesting, but I haven't been coughing as much. And I was like, you know what's kind of nuts? Go outside and see, like, do you have less filament mm. on your patio and other things like that? The, the soot that would come yeah. from exhaust and tire runoff and other things like that. Latex, which is from tires. They were like, you know, my patio is cleaner. I've less that. It's like, maybe you should get an indoor air filter yeah. because you're being exposed to all the stuff. And we know through the EPA that did a study in, a, in the 80s, I think it was 88, that indoor air can be up to 300 times more toxic than outdoor air mm -hmm. because of off-gassing, because of furniture, because of trapped air, because of the air not circulating. So that's another thing that plays into uh, toxicity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mitochondrial health. What do we need to know and how can we actually look at mitochondrial function in our body and the quality of it? Absolutely. So your mitochondria are your energy producing organelles of your cells. So they're, they're these really cool ancient little pieces that used to be bacteria themselves. And now they're the sites where our body produces something called ATP. So ATP is the most simple form of energy in your body and you need ATP not only f to feel good and have energy yourself but also to produce virtually every chemical reaction in the body requires some level of ATP. So to produce your hormones, your immune cells, your cytokines to, you know, regulate your neurotransmitters, all most of these things to you know, beat your, your heartbeat, everything your heart requires, everything requires ATP to actually function. So we want to support our mitochondria because we know that they're crucial to health of our entire body. So it's not just one specific um, organ system. Um, CoQ10 is a measurement that you can run through Quest LabCorp, most conventional labs. So you can actually get a CoQ10 measurement in the blood. CoQ10 is one of the essential nutrients for your mitochondria. It actually is what helps to produce ATP from a cellular level. You know, you actually produce CoQ10 from cholesterol. So any of my patients that are on a statin, so things like Lipitor that reduce cholesterol levels, you have to be on CoQ10. CoQ10 used to be part of the formula of statins, and then I believe they cut it out due to possibly money, or I don't, I don't, I don't know what it was, but it used to be a formula of the statin, and now it's not, so you have to take it separately, because if you're taking a statin, you block the downstream production of CoQ10 that naturally occurs in your body. So it's an essential nutrient if you are on a statin medication. So talk to your doctor about that. Um, but CoQ10 is also just a measure of mitochondrial health and, um, and it's an essential nutrient for the mitochondria. The other thing to test your mitochondria is something called an organic acids test. Um, and this is done by a couple companies. Great Plains has one, Genova has one. And this organic acid test is looking at your urine. So it's actually looking at your urine and what we're looking at are metabolites in the urine, which are byproducts of things. And some of the things that an organic acid test looks at are you know, oxalate um, as well as items of the Krebs cycle. So in biochemistry, if you were pre-med or in the sciences, you'll remember the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, which is the cycle in the mitochondria that helps you produce ATP. So in an organic acids test, we can see those byproducts or those um, products that were needed for that Krebs cycle. So if you have low levels, it may indicate that your mitochondrial status is affected or not running in an optimal fashion. Um, and there's some tests, you know, why the organic acids test is really great is that there's some things that, you know, testing is a little bit 
it's testing is science, but it's also art, mm -hmm. right? Any functional practitioner, naturopathic pra practitioner will tell you, you have to listen to the patient, you have to see their history. And a testing is because it's a snapshot in time. So people will sometimes come in f and do a SIBO test or get a SIBO test done, and that'll come back as negative, but then doctors will look for something on their organic acids test and see that actually this patient probably does have SIBO because it's another way to take a reference on that. Yeah, and so I will run it occasionally for GI patients, like um, people that have any gut conditions, like they have bloating, diarrhea, constipation, and I don't get information on the conventional labs. Organic acids test has been one of the tools that I've used to figure out, you know, do they have higher levels of a clostridia marker, which is a bacteria that could potentially create these GI disturbances um, that might not show up on a, just a conventional lab test. So it allows you to dig a little bit deeper. It also is the, the only test that can really show any um, yeast overgrowth as well in the body, which could contribute to something called CFO, which is small intestinal fungal overgrowth, which has been recognized in the literature as a possible cause for um, just very generalized gastrointestinal complaints like diarrhea, bloating, constipation. Let's pop over to genetics. Yeah. So Ben, um, ben Lynch is a naturopathic doctor and he is definitely in the forefront of genetics so i would always suggest people check his book out dirty genes has a ton more information on genetics a great resource that i've used past, past podcasts oh, that we can link to as well yeah um in terms of what i run in my practice um which can be run through a conventional company as well as an eclectic lab company which is you know, more what functional medicine doctors use, APOE is one of the tests that I think is a good one to run on the population because it tells you a little bit about your risk for Alzheimer's, but also how you process saturated fats in the body. So APOE4, I referenced it before, but it actually has a evolutionary advantage. So people with APOE4 allele, in a gene, you have two alleles. You have one for mom, one from dad, right? So everybody has two of these. And in the APOE4 gene, you can either have a two allele, so APOE2, which is protective against Alzheimer's, APOE3, which is basically um, kind of neutral, and then APOE4, which increases your risk of Alzheimer's by about two to three times if you have one allele and 12 times the risk of Alzheimer's if you have both alleles, both for mom and dad. However, APOE4 originally was protective. So if you look at our ancestors, the reason why APOE4 was protective is that it decreased your risk for getting a parasite, which could lead to death. So it's one of those things that it used to have a very um, good utility in our body. And now that our risk for um, parasites is so much lower, it's just increasing the risk for um, neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's specifically. APOE4 also signifies that you may not do well with a high fat diet, especially saturated fats, compared to people without that APOE4 allele. Right, and there's APOE, APO, APOB, that's yep. part of that. That's also related to saturated fats? So a people with ApoE4 alleles, so ApoE4 is a genetic marker. ApoB is the receptor on things like LDL particles. It's found on LDL particles as well as LP little a particles. And so ApoB, if you have elevated levels of ApoB, um, that increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. And the tie with ApoE4 is that people with ApoE4 alleles, either one or two, have likely have higher ApoB levels, increasing their risk for cardiovascular disease as well. Which is me. I have that. Yeah, and, I do as well, actually. And uh, I was noticing, you know, I I used to put like MCT oil in mm -hmm. my coffee and I was eating a lot more grass-fed, you know, meats that were there, like beef and things like that. And uh, when I figured that out, I started to cut a lot of that down because even though like keto is very big and like, yeah. you know, all these different things that are out there, this is where testing and this is where personalizing for you is a better fit. It doesn't mean that I don't have it all the time, but I actually feel better. Yeah. And it, yeah, this is where personalized nutrition is so important. This is why I, I love what I do because you can actually tailor it to the individual, which I think is really, it's 
first of all, just fun, but it also is very effective in reducing your risk for certain um, chronic diseases. And so with ApoE4, the other thing is that, you know, you and I would not respond well to a statin. So if we had elevated cholesterol later in life, we're not a great candidate for a statin. We would respond better to a lower fat diet and lifestyle modifications. So first of all, we're about an hour and 50 minutes in. So anybody who's listening and you've kept up so far, amazing. I hope you've been loving this. This is like really like a deep workshop on all things lab and health and other stuff. And I know this community is really deep into the science and loves to learn about it, even if that's not your background. So thank you for being with us so far. And Mary, I'm gonna give you a challenge. We have two more categories here. Let's cover them in like five, 10 minutes so that we can be right, I'm gonna to try to hit like right at the two hour mark so we say we have a two hour deep dive workshop on all things lab health and how to know if you're really healthy. Let's go to the next one, which is neurological. Yeah, so neurological, it's actually gonna be super short because we already covered it. My favorite neurological test is gonna be ApoE4 getting a risk for Alzheimer's disease, cardio for sure is included in that, and that brain volumetric scan that I mentioned earlier in the neurological assessment. So that's pretty much all I have for neuro. There's a bunch of things that you could add, but those are my highlights there. So let's talk about anti-aging then. Yeah, so anti-aging, and we've been talking, everything that we've already covered is, is already all, all anti-aging because if you die early from cardiovascular disease, then you know that should have been your anti-aging marker that you looked at earlier. How your mitochondria produce energy is related yes. to aging, your health of your bacteria, your immune system, that's everything yeah. is anti-aging. So the only aging marker that I want to mention is telomeres. So you can actually check your telomere length. Uh, SpectraCell is the lab that we use, but there's a bunch of different labs that check telomere length. And telomeres are the caps on your DNA. So your DNA contains all of the information that you use to produce proteins in your body. And these telomeres that cap the ends of those DNA um, filaments shorten as we age. So your telomeres get shorter and shorter. You can check the length of your telomeres to get your biological age versus your chronological age. So, you know, I know my age, but how old is my body? And that's what your telomeres will tell you. Fantastic. Anything else you want to add to anti-aging? No, there's, there's ways you can increase the length of your telomeres. Meditation has been shown to increase it. So again, it's not just information, but it can be Certain actionable. supplements like NAD can be potentially yep. protected. NAC as well. NAC. And acetylcysteine, glutathione, selenium have all been um, looked at for lengthening telomeres possibly. Mary, that's... 13 separate categories around vital areas that are related to understanding how truly healthy you are. <laughs> and first of all, congratulations, well done. Thank you, you for you doing well. that. Uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. And I wanna add in this is that, you know, we don't cover every one of these areas to tell people that you gotta go in and get tested for all these different things. Really, testing is useful only after hearing a patient's story and what they're experiencing. Based on that, a doctor like yourself is gonna be able to go in to their toolbox and say, okay, huh, what do we need to look into? What do we have to see? Now there's obviously tests like vitamin D and other levels and things like that that everybody across the board should get because we know a lot of people are deficient, but the rest of it is tools in a toolbox. To know that they're there, whether you are able to work with a functional medicine doctor or not, to even ask your regular doctor what you know, should I be getting this test done? Or, hey, I've heard these thyroid things are important. Hey, I've heard that Hashimoto's could be a thing. Maybe we should do there. Even as much as like, you know, I see this mug, it actually kind of frustrates me a little bit. There's this mug that I've seen a photo on the internet sometimes is that, you know, my medical degree is uh, something is more important than your Google search, right? Like sometimes doctors have that. And I totally get it. You know, we don't want to go to WebMD and say that we have every single thing or think that we know more than doctor. But no, a doctor-patient relationship is a complementary relationship. And there are some times because the medical literature, especially in the space of nutrition science is changing all the time, you might come across something that's interesting that you can then go and in a polite way say, here's what I've seen. And if your doctor has the heart of a teacher, will say like, hey, listen, yeah, okay, great, totally fine. Let's talk about that thing. Here's what I've been seeing on my end, or I actually don't know a lot about that. If they're dismissive, or if they're like, you know, why would you bring that up? It's like, I would know what the right test to do, which that happens, by the way, all the time, right? And I think that often happens with older patients, and unfortunately, like a lot of older women, who I feel like doctors, men or women, sometimes just sort of dismiss. And so if that's you, if you've been through that process, like find another doctor. 
It's about finding a doctor who has the heart of a teacher and can really walk down the path of education and research and say, hey, okay, yes, I see why that's really a buzzword right now, keto, but here's my thoughts that are on it. Or, hey, I understand why people are saying to test for this, but here's why I don't think that you are you know, in need of that. Whatever their answer is, as long as they take you down that path of education and that journey. So that's my point on that. Anything you would add to that, Mary? No, I think I think that patient doctor relationship is super important to work with somebody that you trust and that you have a good um, you have a good bond with because your relationship with your doctor actually determines in part the outcomes of your treatment. We know that from the research that yeah, if you don't feel like they have your back, yeah, or if you feel like what they're telling you is not in alignment with where you want to be, that's going to impact your you know, your ability to even execute upon that. Mm -hmm. So those are all super important. Mary, I would love to give you a little plug here, obviously just being your friend and you having worked on really great stuff with us. um, Tell us about your clinic and the type of patient that typically comes to you. Yeah, so we specialize in integrative gastroenterology, so all things stomach. We do a lot of treatment for, you know, bloating, diarrhea, constipation that your doctor has likely already worked up and you have no serious conditions going on, but you still have all these symptoms. So that's one of the most common things that I treat are functional bowel disorders. Um, I also do fecal microbiota transplantation, which is a little bit different. And so, you know, with that, I'm working with a lot of people with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And then one of the more common things that we see come through our practice, just be based on the numbers of, you know, what everybody is experiencing is um, hormonal imbalances. So things with premenopausal women as well as bioidenticals with postmenopausal women, low testosterone with men. And then thyroid is a huge percentage of what we're looking at just because I think in conventional medicine, thyroid um, disorders can really fall through the cracks and just not get the attention that they deserve. And uh, you don't have to have something wrong with you per se to come and work with you. You even work with people who are like, okay, look, I think I'm doing pretty good and I eat pretty healthy and I'm into it, but I've just never done any of my labs and I don't know and I feel healthy, but I want to look into it and just make sure. So you work with those individuals too. Yeah, I've got to have you on my team in terms of promoting me. You do a better job than I do. Um, I love, that's one of my favorite po- populations to work with is just like a wellness, comprehensive performance wellness panel. Like, yeah, I'm well, I want to get weller, and I want to make sure that there's nothing hidden that could possibly reduce reduce my health span or my lifespan. Um, so those are really fun to work with. And, you know, those can be very intermittent. We could see you once or twice a year and just make sure that we're keeping up on your health and preventing anything from ever happening in the first place. We're also doing telemedicine. So most of our patients are virtual. And those are even patients in LA that just don't want to deal with the traffic or parking or anything like that. So most of the things that we can do virtual and there's even labs that we can do from the comfort of your home. Awesome. I know there's a course that you've been involved with before with Commune that we did together, but I think you also have your own course with Commune too. Yes, yeah. So I have a gut health course coming out and that should launch, I'm hoping in May, but it should launch soon regardless. And so we really do a deep dive into everything gut health from constipation, bloating, what should your poop look like, um, what's abnormal, what's totally normal. And, um, and how can you take action and really improve your gut health, not just so you don't have those symptoms, but also to optimize your gut microbiome, which we know is involved in every single organ system that we have. So that is through a company called Commune. It's onecommune.com slash gut health is the course. And that's where you can find it. Is it gut health or slash gut? Slash gut. It's slash gut. I don't even know where my own course is. <laughs> well, the link will be in the show notes there. Thanks. Tell us where you're most active on social media if people want to find you and your social handles. Instagram is definitely where I'm most active. It's dr.marypardee, and that's my Instagram. And then website-wise, it's modernmed.com, M-O-D-R-N-M-E-D.com are the two places you can find me. I know in addition to the telemedicine, you know, your whole goal is like really how to like make this more accessible and things like that. You know, just offhand, like if somebody wants to work with you, what's the cost of a first appointment? Yeah, so the cost is going to be anywhere from 380 to $450, depending on which of us, like our practitioners you work with. Um, but we're definitely one of the more affordable telemedicine companies and just functional medicine practices, especially in the LA area. Yeah, that's great. And I'm all about options and ranges. You know, I've shared with listeners in the past, I'm an investor in different companies in this space, 
my business partner has a medical clinic that I'm involved in, but I think the thing is that we need to have more options. We need to have this more mainstream. And also too, it's about finding the doctor that you resonate with. Mm -hmm. Somebody might have heard something that you said in a way that you can only say it or explain it, and they feel like, wow, I wanna work with that type of doctor. So it's very much a dance in finding somebody that you feel excited about working with, that you resonate with, and that you feel will have your back in the long run to achieve your optimal and uh, best health. Mary, thank you so much. Two hours, we did it exactly. Two <laughs> hours and 19 seconds, Woo. plus probably my intro, let's say two hours and one minute. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing this knowledge and information with our audience. Uh, please, please, audience, if you can, hit her up on social media and just tell her and tag her and share this podcast with your friends. I'm sure they'd really love it. Mary, thank you for being on the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so appreciative and I'm so grateful of the opportunity to have worked with you and your team. It really means a lot to me and you guys are honestly one of the best, best health teams I've ever worked with. So I appreciate you all. Appreciate you too. Thank you, Mary.